Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. This is Encounter. We have a special guest today for a second episode. We have uh, Swami Puru Chetanya from The Art of Living. He's an international director and he's specially charged for the African region. He's in Mauritius uh, for the very first time. Swami Puru Chetanya, very warm welcome to you again in the studios of the NBC. And thank you for still being here. Thank you so much, Roshan. Happy to be here again. Oh, so tell us, how has been uh, your experience in the country so far? It's been beautiful. I mean, they've been keeping me busy. We've had a lot of programs, but then in between, wherever we got some time, I had a chance to see more of the, of the country, of the island. And uh, just yesterday, I was sharing with one of our local volunteers. I said, no, you, you are so fortunate because many of them were sharing that once or twice a week, we go swimming or we go for a hike. And you see people who come from all over the world to experience this for a few days. And for you guys, you can just get in the car and half an hour, one hour drive, and you're in a, such a beautiful spot. All right, let's come back to why you're in Mauritius. Uh, you've been carrying out courses. You've done uh, the Sudarshan Kriya course, and you've done a few advanced courses. My main question to you would be, being a youngster yourself, and you've had many other young people coming to your course. Of course, there yeah. were less young old people who came, but what did you notice in Mauritius in terms of uh, the response and how, it's, how you think it will go forward? See, what I've seen is that, uh, and I've seen this in other places as well, I think nowadays if we look at the youth, uh, which uh, can be like you can say college, university age, or uh, young professionals, or uh, maybe they're young, they're not so professional, but they're in that age group. Uh, if you see nowadays, a uh, lot of the youth, they're actually quite advanced. No? They have a lot of knowledge of the world. They have a lot more exposure than we used to have in, in the past. You know, people used to, you see some of the world when you go for a holiday or uh, from TV, but if you see the kind of exposure we have now is that many of the youth, they have already lived a lot, actually. They have seen so much of the world through the social media, through internet. There's a, there's a big influx of information. Yeah, so it, it also, uh, you can say, gives a kind of maturity that we didn't see before. So you see, many of the youth, they are not uh, ready to settle for just a, a standard life where you say, okay, you eat, sleep, work, you achieve a few things, and that's it. They say, okay, we have seen this, we have been there, we have worked for some time, you have done, tasted this, been there, and they say, okay, there must be something more to life. Is there more to life? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I think this may be one of the reasons also why we see nowadays there is so much more, uh, um, you can say, exposure or uh, to drugs because it is, you can't just blame it on, you know, peer pressure or something like that. I think for many of the youth, there is also a, uh, that, that innate desire where they say, okay, I know there must be something more, and they want to experience that. So that's why and, they go for drugs? And it is one of the reasons, because, see, when you do drugs, what happens, you get an experience of that you're more than just the body, you know? It may not be authentic, it may not be uh, healthy, but it does. It's an alternate state of mind yeah. also. So, and I think that's why also we see that more and more, uh, especially the youth, they are so interested in uh, meditation, in spirituality, because they say, okay, there must be something more. Uh, this is something which in the past, you can say through religion also, people used to get an experience. But because maybe more and more, uh, the focus shifted to the rituals. And the youth saying, see, what is the point in just doing some ritual if we're not getting any experience? No? But also it should make sense. Exactly. And we've seen, uh, like, uh, even when it comes to things like the breathing techniques, the pranayamas, the meditation, uh, many of the programs, many of the youth have come up to me and they said, you know, this is so nice because we were looking for something authentic, but then this is the first time it was explained so properly or, you know, you have the scientific aspect There's to it. There's the whole science behind it, exactly. which makes sense. And then when you understand, you say, oh, yeah, this is something that works for me. You know, just saying, okay, you do this because it works, unless, you know, you understand for some people, it's not enough. They say, okay, we want to know how it works. How does this, and the beauty is that uh, many of these practices earlier, it was a little bit, you can say, airy-fairy. Uh, in India, of course, the tradition is ancient and it's very scientific. But if you see, for example, with the hippie culture, they took some of those things and it spread across the world. People, they were happy to meditate and get high and that's it. But not with uh, the real authentic science and the knowledge behind it. And uh, I've seen that many, many of the youth, they are very interested. And uh, when they get a proper understanding of it, they're uh, very open to it. And people have great experiences. And uh, this is something that, uh, that we have to offer. This is where it's important to have a guru, Definitely. Um, a master. Yes. So more and more people are getting into meditation. More and more people are getting into drugs. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of an imbalance. 
Not really, I think, in the sense that we've seen that wherever we do these programs, uh, it is also very beneficial for people who have gone into addictions, you know, to get them out of it. And because you're providing them with an, uh, uh, with an authentic experience, which is not harmful to the system, which is not harmful to the mind, and which is authentic. So a uh, natural high. Yeah, definitely. A, a natural, natural high. A natural uh, side effect free high <laughs> that, uh, that doesn't have any low. Yes. You know? And I think that is, uh, uh, that is what we've seen, like, for example, uh, one of my good friends, he used to be a gang member, actually. Uh, I met him only after that, just for the <laughs> record. But uh, he's from Denmark, so uh, he was introduced to some of these programs when he was in the, the gang life by one of our uh, Art of Living faculties there, who was himself also a part of these things before he was introduced to the program. But he saw this is so beneficial. So he used to go and meet up with his old friend and say, you know, now I have a breathing technique. It'll give you such a nice high, but no side effects. It's free. And he used to get them to do the program. And such a transformation happened that at some point, even the Justice Department found out, came up to him and he said, no, we have re recently realized that the drug-related uh, drug crimes have gone down, the violence has gone down, trafficking has gone down. And we found out that you are doing these programs and that is the reason. So now uh, the program that we have for, uh, for prisoners and for people who have been, uh, you know, like at risk youth and all that, it's actually become part of the correctional system there where people say, okay, you go through this program, then we'll reduce your sentence because they've seen that it's so effective. So you did mention that uh, many of your courses are focused on uh, in prisons, but also it's probably one of the same uh, Breathing techniques that you mention, you practice during university? Essence is the same because it's about that, no managing your mind, your emotions, cleaning your system from all these toxins and impressions, and uh, getting your mind in the right space. Oh, fantastic. So, and uh, what did you notice uh, in terms of uh, Mauritians? Uh, do they want to know more? Uh... Definitely, definitely. And I think uh, even when you see that, you know, um, when we look at some of the problems with the, the school going youth also, and it's not just the drugs, no, that is one, one aspect of it, but uh, one of the reasons also they're getting in because they may be bored, they don't have a vision in life, they don't have a direction, they don't have that, um, they don't have a role model or they don't have the inspiration to do something constructive with their life. No, because when you see, when people are really passionate about something, when they're busy, they're, there's a very small likelihood, a very small chance they get into any of these things, whether it is crime, whether it is drugs, whether it's any of these uh, problems, we can say. So uh, what uh, we were discussing also with some of our team here is that, uh, for example, in South Africa, in the United States, we've had very successful programs also uh, where we uh, um, work also in the, in the schools and with the schools, with the community, where the school-going youth, we have a program for them which not just teaches them some of these breathing techniques, but also gives them that bigger vision that, okay, to give them some guidance and inspiration that, okay, what do you want to do in life? Uh, why are you here? You know, what is it that you want to experience, achieve, and how can you be more useful? So it also includes a, uh, an aspect of taking responsibility, where you say, okay, let me do something, not just for myself, but for my community. So you see that the respect towards the parents, to the teachers changes, the way they behave with each other changes. It's a holistic change all yes. around. So we've seen, levels. yeah, and, and nowadays, if you see for, for teachers also, it's a very stressful profession, you know, it's, it's sad actually. Earlier, people used to have a lot of respect for the teachers, but now you see many, many teachers even are afraid to go to school, you yes. know, which yes, is a, a it's a sad thing because then what happens is you start losing uh, many of the quality teachers and... Uh, is it because children are less receptive also? Yeah, it, it works both ways. Because you mentioned earlier that uh, the children are more exposed to information now, but it's also a good thing, but also not a, not a so good thing. Yeah, it, 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 now it, it all the more depends on the teacher that how are you able to connect with the student? If you're just giving them information because you have to, because it's your job, you have to make your hours, then you can't blame many of them to say that, you know, like I get better explanations on YouTube or I can find the information of the things that I inter find, I'm interested in. So then you have to really see, okay, how can I connect? How I can make it relevant for the student? How I can make it uh, so that he can relate it with his life? And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why also you see that uh, slowly uh, on a global level, some places faster than others, uh, you see that the, the way we teach also and the education system is changing has to change. It because, has to evolve. Yeah, because if some place we see it's still the same for the last 40, 50 years, which doesn't work. It's outdated. You know? It's the same for the past 150 years. Yeah, because <laughs> earlier it was you learn this and then you know it the rest of your life, you can apply it. Now if you see the way that 
the information changes, things change so quickly that you learn something now, four years later, it's outdated. Two years now. Yeah, or two years. So if you're doing a three-year course at university level, by the time what you're studying in the third year, yeah. when you're in your third year, what you study in the first year is already outdated. Exactly. It's so it's, it's how fast that's yeah. going. So nowadays. in Holland, uh, I remember when I went to school, that already they were focusing more on teaching us how to uh, find the, the proper information, how to be able to get the right information for yourself so that you're able where to, you know where to look, you're able to verify that, yeah, this is authentic or this is proper, this is up to date, rather than stuffing a lot of information because if this is anyway going to get outdated. It's better that you know where you get it, where to get it, how to get it, so that when you need it, you can actually get that information. And evolve with it also, probably. Exactly, yeah. Allow me to ask you a, a different question now. No problem. Um, your original name is Alexander. Correct. But um, since you've joined uh, Out of Living, um, Sri Sri Ravi has given your name, and you're known under the name as Swami Puru Chaitanya. But uh, Swami refers to a guru, to a master, so as a teacher, right? Um, not entirely. And also, one thing just to clarify, I, I didn't get this name right when I joined Art of Living. No? Of course. After yeah, being a, 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 um, a teacher there and a disciple of my master, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, for many years, uh, I had already decided that I would like to uh, do something bigger with my life. I didn't have much of a family responsibility. My parents are taken care of. I have a younger brother also. And then uh, even when I was young, I had this desire to do something more for the world. So I didn't need much for myself. I said, okay, I'm anyway happy. So just working and making some money for me doesn't seem like a good option. So I wanted to serve in a bigger way. So I had decided I would like to dedicate my life to service. I came to uh, India. I was there, living there for a few years already as a full-time faculty trainer with the Art of Living, involved with various service projects. And then at some point, uh, uh, my master, Sri Sri Ravi Shankarji, he gave me this, uh, uh, this opportunity. He said, if you want to serve in that way, uh, to become a, what we call a Swami. So a Swami is basically a monk, you can say. It is a, a sannyasi, one who has renounced his personal life, where you say, I don't live for myself anymore. I live to serve the world. So uh, literally, the word Swami means one who is established in the self. And uh, it is a, it's an ancient tradition, so you cannot become one yourself. You have to be initiated by, course, by a teacher, by a master. So uh, you can say it is a, uh, yeah, I guess a good word is like a monk, you can say a renunciate, who uh, has two aims in life. It's very beautifully defined in the scriptures. It says, the one thing you live for is atma mokshartam, which means uh, self-realization, realizing yes, your so true nature. The, or the, the direction of the soul is towards liberation. Yes, yeah, okay. so striving for that. So you can say your connection with yourself or with the divine. And the other aspect is Jagat which means working for the good of the world in whatever capacity it's needed. Which connects to what you want to, you want to do in life anyways. Yeah, so that is the service aspect where you look around and you say, okay, what can I do for my fellow human beings? And uh, so it is an ancient uh, practice, a tradition that when someone... Uh, takes up this. It's like you, uh, your old life is finished and you have like a new life. So then they change the name also to signify that, okay, you're no longer living for yourself. You don't have that limited identity anymore. So the master gives you a new name. So it is not the name I've chosen myself. The name Purna Chaitanya was given to me by my master. Is, is it a way of how you bury your, your old life and start a new life like a phoenix, uh, a yes. rebirth, and phoenix you spread actually... your wings and fly again? to new heights and new freedom also. Yeah, and Phoenix is a nice example actually because that's why you see that uh, usually uh, uh, a sannyasi, a swami, they either wear white because uh, it's, a, it's a sign of purity and also because it contains all the colors, or they wear uh, the orange, the, the, the saffron robes, yes. which symbolizes the fire of, uh, of knowledge. And because when you become a swami, there is a ceremony and it is like, you can say, your own cremation. So, okay. so they actually say, okay, yes, your old life is done, and uh, now you have a new life. So like you said, it is really like a kind of rebirth, you can say, where you say, okay, now I will no longer worry about me, that what about me, what will happen to me? My only concern is what can I do for the people around me? At but least, also you should take care of yourself first. That is taken care of it so many works. times. Even you come to a place, you don't know anybody. Someone will come up to you and, and ask you, okay, where are you from? And, and before you know it, you have a place to stay. Uh, no, you have food to eat, so yeah, we're not really worried about those things. 
to, to our viewers uh, watching either online or on TV uh, who don't know who you are, who don't know anything about yeah. the Art of Living Foundation, what would you tell them? Uh, a simple advice or a couple of simple advices that would probably help them improve their daily lives. I think one of the most important things is that uh, when you realize that, yes, everything we do, we are so busy with is because we want to be happy. But many times we forget that unless you are peaceful, unless your mind is taken care of, there is no guarantee you will be happy. So we spend so much time running around, uh, going to parties, having a nice holiday, having a comfortable house, having good food to eat. But if your mind is disturbed, then you cannot enjoy it. And we see this. Sometimes you go for a holiday and you really worked for it hard. You spend a lot of money and you reach there, but something has happened and you're not, uh, you know, you're not peaceful. You're, you're not angry, you're able upset. to disconnect and you're not enjoying the holiday. Yeah, so. and then the holiday, you're just worrying about your work or your relationship or your 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 day-to-day -day life. And then you're not getting your values, you know, which you wanted to get, your money's worth. So we have to take out some time and you cannot do that once a year. Every day, take out a little time to settle down, allow the mind to settle down, come back to your center where you are peaceful, you're happy, you're contented. And when you act from that space, a beautiful shift happens where instead of living your whole life doing so many things in a pursuit of happiness, you can do all those things happily. All right, all right, it's the other way around. Okay. So there's a beautiful shift that instead of thinking that happiness is in the future, you can be happy now and then you act. You because be happiness happy is only now. It's always now. Yeah. There's only one moment, and the moment is always yeah. now. But we keep postponing. We think, if I get this, I'll be happy. And then when you get it, you think another thing. If I get that, you know? But so happiness is an attitude. It's not a, it does not depend on external factors or yeah. on other people. Uh, we, we, we were talking earlier before the recording of this uh, episode, and you mentioned that you would advise everyone to carry out three acts of service. But this goes beyond the material aspect of carrying out this service. Can, can we debunk that a bit for, for our viewers? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, like we were discussing, so one of the assignments sometimes we, we give people is to do three random acts of kindness. And uh, what happens is uh, we tell people, okay, and this, uh, even the viewers, everybody can, can try this practice if they would like to, that you keep that intention in your mind, that you don't have to uh, really think hard and look for something, you have that attitude that, okay, if there is in some way I can contribute, help out someone, keep that with you, you will see there are so many opportunities. You, know, you may be walking past your neighbor's house, you see some laundry has fallen off the line, you can put it back on the line. Or you see someone uh, you know, has left their, uh, their car lights uh, uh, on, you can tell them that, okay, you know, your lights of your car are on because the battery will get drained. Uh, you may be able to help someone cross the street or uh, help them out in some other way. The beauty is when you do something for someone else without expecting anything in return, not even a thank you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they may not even know it was you. Like I said, if you help someone out by putting their laundry back on the line, they'll never find out it was you. But then the beauty is that apart from the fact that you're helping out someone, so on a subtle level, definitely that good vibration is going to come back to you. It also, in a subtle way, changes us that it shifts the attitude from only thinking what about me to what can I do for other people. And the beauty is, like we saw, that happiness is our nature. You know, if you don't need anything to be happy, actually. Many times when you feel happy, you cannot really pinpoint the reason why. But whenever you're miserable, when you're not happy, you know exactly, you know exactly why. why. So if someone asks you, why are you unhappy, why are you miserable, they'll come the whole story you will get. <laughs> so the beauty is that uh, when you see, the less you actually worry about yourself, the less you worry that why, why am I not happy or am I happy, you'll find that you're anyway happy. So the less you think about what about me and the more you think what can I do for other people around me, you will see a shift in your consciousness and the quality of your life. And that is why uh, normally I tell people that if you're really looking for job satisfaction, don't think you can get it from a job. No, real satisfaction only comes from service. You can do your job as a service. Like as a teacher, if you say, I want to make sure that I teach the students nicely, even if that means I have to stay up late sometimes to find up some new stories to share with them, or you stay back after class to help those few students that need it, then you come from a service aspect, not just because you're getting paid. So um, from taking the uh, three random acts of uh, service, and it goes more beyond uh, the material aspect of it. Uh, does it also help people know themselves better in terms of 
what makes them happy, what's their comfort zone, but also moving out of the comfort zone and what they like, what they don't like, in terms of discovering themselves deeper? Definitely. And that is one of the beautiful things we've seen with many of our volunteers from the Art of Living Foundation also in our projects and service activities where sometimes we uh, work in places which are really challenging. Like there may be a natural calamity like an earthquake or a flood. It may be man-made calamities like a war zone uh, or where there was a, a, you know, a, a, an ethnic conflict or whatever it may be where uh, people go to places where physically they may not be comfortable because there's no proper place to stay, no proper food. I have worked in, in tribal jungle areas where you, know, you sleep around a fireplace in a bamboo hut or you eat that uh, jungle leaves and, and rice just boiled. Uh, but then the beauty is because you're doing it for more than something than just yourself, that is which actually allows you to come out of the comfort zone. Because if it's for you, then you stay within your comfort zone. So you push your limits. Yeah, and the beauty is the moment you step out of your comfort zone, with that step, your comfort zone has increased. So you see that bit by bit, people become more and more comfortable, you can say. And you find that your, uh, not just your comfort zone, your sense of belongingness, your identity expands, where you come to a point where uh, we have so many of our teachers, our trainers, our project uh, leaders and volunteers who are such beautiful human beings where you can send them anywhere in the world right now, and they will be comfortable, they will feel at home, and they will do something good there. And even though they might not speak the language, the food may be different, but because their comfort zone has become so big that you can say, you know, I am ready to, you know, to do anything uh, if it's required of me to, to help someone else, and it has empowered them to such an extent. You know, these people, they, they are such successful uh, project leaders, they are such successful organizers, where uh, now many of them, they give uh, talks in, in companies and management institutes uh, teaching people how about leadership skills, about management, uh, because in a practical experience, they have become so successful at it. I was about to ask you, why is it so important to achieve all these? See, from a personal point of view, if you say that you're doing service to help another person, uh, there cannot be uh, an aspect of personal gain, because then again, you're not doing it to, without expecting anything in return. So. I wouldn't say that our people are serving because they get something out of it. They do it because it's their nature, because they're happy. They feel contented. They say, I'm taken care of. I'm happy. Now, what can I do for others? But the beauty is that, yes, it comes with a lot of benefits. Before wrapping up this interview, there's a major, I wouldn't say issue, but I've noticed that a lot of people, they do service and they get attached to the end result. Mm. Uh, the happiness, the blessings, or even uh, whatever comes with it after. Mm. But then is, is, is it right to say that you, then you're doing service for the wrong reasons? Even See, if you're still doing it for somebody else, but then you, be, you start becoming attached, the ego starts getting attached to the result of, oh, yeah, I've done something good, or oh, this person is feeling better. How do you draw the line? So that is the skill that you say yes. And I think that's where uh, that introspection also is important. Because like you said, people may start off with all the good intentions, but then somewhere you may get attached to the recognition, to the, the social status. or That's what we see. Many people, they do a lot of good service, but then when it's time to leave the seat that someone else can be the chairman or someone else can be the... People are not ready to do so. And uh, you see this uh, many times. I, uh, I wonder about where people give a donation. You know, uh, That's a kind of service. So they may sponsor or they may build a wing for a hospital, or a classroom for a school, or they may build a hall for a temple, or a church, or something like and that. they say, I did but, that. But I then you see that. this, this uh, marble uh, plate somewhere, which says this was, this was donated, donated yeah. by so-and-so. So then, right there and then, actually your service has ended, because you have bought that plate. You have put a whole hospital wing, so that your name can be there, so that is a business, it's not a service. So, uh, again, so, sometimes it is a practice. Uh, I don't want to generalize where you say that all those people are, are not doing real service or their intention is not pure. But definitely, like you said, if somewhere also that thing is there where you want a recognition, uh, it can be a seat in front of the audience or a special uh, uh, sofa or a special note of thanks. See, people will give it. That is uh, their good courtesy. And we should not tell people also that, OK, OK, you, you should not mention me anywhere. But we will know if somewhere you feel that, yes, I want that recognition, or they should mention me, or they should give me that, yeah, then it's not service anymore. 
So you should or probably maybe try it's to not full. You full should name. probably try to dissociate your name from whenever you do a service. At least inside. At least inside. Outside, we cannot stop people from praising. If you sure. see, like Mother Teresa is a beautiful example of someone who was just doing service, and in the end, she was so well known. She could call the White House uh, in the U.S. even. Yeah. yeah. But then uh, she will not say that. Okay, you have to give me this kind of status. If you see the same with Sri Ravi Shankar, our founder. So many governments call upon him for, for guidance, for advice. He has addressed uh, people across the world, corporate leaders. But still, I've seen him. You go to a program, and uh, if the chair is not proper, or if uh, you know, there may not be a, a glass of water for him to drink, or he may be seated somewhere on the side, or uh, he will not say anything. And not just he doesn't say anything, he doesn't bother. No, you don't have to call him uh, you know, Guruji or, or His Holiness, or this is the courtesy people have extended. Uh, you can call him anything. Many of us call him Sri Sri. You can call him, uh, some people still call him Ravi because they know him from before or Pandit Ravi Shankar. Or, so he is probably fine with that. And the same goes for me. Sometimes people ask, okay, how should we address you? I said, see, the name which uh, I use now is Purna Chaitanya. And uh, uh, the Swami is a title because it's like, you know, like a doctor, you can say. So it's, people know that, okay, what am I doing? Uh, why am I dressed like this? But that doesn't mean people have to, to call me uh, with, okay, you have to call me Swami or Swamiji course, or, or uh, you know, people come up with all kinds of creative things. <laughs> so the most important thing is that within, and like you said, uh, you will know, if somewhere you feel there is a, uh, you know, you feel a need for people to praise you or to recognize you, then uh, that is a cue for yourself. It's okay, this is something I still have to work on. And uh, that doesn't mean everybody has to be perfect. But the beauty of the, this knowledge and the spiritual practices that it helps you to again and again come back to the source where uh, you come to a point where uh, you are comfortable anywhere. You know, however people treat you, uh, whatever food you get, whatever place you have to stay. Because you know that you are more than just the body and you are here for a bigger purpose. Fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing so much insight. It has been a pleasure having you for this episode of Encounter, for this second episode of Encounter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of this episode of Encounter. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. Swami Puruchetan, thank you very much. Thank if, you you have, if you have an email, do you have any suggestion, uh, any questions or inquiries about our guests, drop an email, encounter at mbc.itnet.mu. Until then, goodbye. Next week, on the same channel, at the same time.